Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Adam Woodhall, and I am the Executive Director of Lawyers for Net Zero, and I am delighted to be moderating this session today on what needs to change or evolve in the governance at world and national levels. And we have some excellent speakers today, so really looking forward to uh, working with you. And that's not my name that you can see on the screen. Um, it's Adam Woodhall. Um, so what I would like to do is, first of all, introduce uh, our first speaker. And that is uh, Lindsay Levin. Um, and she is the founding partner of uh, Future, <coughs> Future Stewards, um, as well as being working on the TED Countdown and TED uh, and the Counters In initiatives. Um, but she is uh, probably best known for her work as the CEO and founder of Leaders Quest. So I'm going to now hand over to uh, Lindsay. Well, thanks, Adam, and hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to talking to you about how we build coalitions to solve big problems. And I'm going to focus on the part that's often missing, not the hard skills of expertise or analysis, but the soft skills of awareness and relationships. Let me start with a story. The first tree I ever hugged was a giant oak in an ancient forest in Devon, England. I was there with the ecologist Stefan Harding to learn about the carbon cycle. It was a perfect spring day, and yes, Stefan asked us each to find a tree to hug and then to lie face down on the forest floor and simply look at what was in front of our eyes. I saw moss as if for the first time, subtle shades of green and blue, feathery stems, intricate patterns. And I thought about some photographs I'd seen recently, images of the universe taken from the space telescope Hubble, huge clouds of drifting color from the dawn of the solar system. Thinking about moss and the magnificence of space, I was reminded of an ancient Buddhist story about Indra, the god of heavens. When Indra fashioned the world, he made it as a net, and at every knot in the net, he tied a pearl. According to the story, everything that exists or has ever existed, every idea is a pearl in the net, and every single pearl reflects an image of the entire web. Relying on that forest floor, I truly got this idea. The beauty of the tiniest elements of nature and the wonder of an infinite universe the sense that each is part of the other, that we're all connected. It lit a spark, and in 2001, I founded Leaders Quest, an organization with a mission to grow wise leaders who are committed to building a regenerative future. I spent the next decade and a half traveling all over the world, working with business people keen to put purpose at the center of their mission, and with community leaders tackling injustice and poverty at the grassroots. And then in 2016, just after the Paris Climate Agreement was signed, I co-founded Future Stewards, a network of organizations working towards a new economic system, one that regenerates nature and rebalances inequality. So I've spent the last 20 years bringing people together from business, government, and nonprofits. And what I've learned is that to solve tough problems, we all need to get a lot, lot better at collaborating. Yes, we've got ideas. We've got expertise, we're very smart. But when it comes to building true partnership, especially with people beyond our own immediate circle, that turns out to be hard. And it matters today more than ever because we're living at a time of accelerating change when the gaps between us are extreme and seem to be widening. The problems are interconnected and systemic and so are the solutions. We can and must tackle the global health crisis, inequality, climate change, and loss of biodiversity. We can and must address social and planetary challenges at speed and scale. But to do that, we have to figure out how to cooperate across industry, sectors, and nations, how to work with people with different life experiences and worldviews. At the start of this year, I took time to stand back and ask myself, what have I learned? from some of the amazing people I've met who were working on seemingly intractable problems. I focused on people who are an inspiration to others, who've taken life's ups and downs, especially the downs, and made sense of them, becoming more courageous and compassionate. 
people who've developed self-awareness and humility whilst keeping a sense of wonder. I asked myself, who amongst them is building new networks of leaders with the same compassion and courage? Who's scaling these skills and what do they have in common? I thought about men like Ali Abu Awad from Bethlehem, who lost his brother in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and is now, now leading a movement for nonviolent change and peaceful coexistence, even in the midst of today's conflict. Or Jessica Taylor from Detroit, who with her co-founder Tom Adams built an amazing life-changing program for people serving long prison sentences, many of them victims of mass incarceration. Their programs have helped thousands of men and women turn their lives around and go on to become mentors to others. Ali, Jessica and Tom are all working inside flawed systems with entrenched injustice. They're successful because their work is founded on love and the practice of creating change one person at a time, day after day. So how do we develop this kind of awareness? I think it starts with a way of seeing. People who build effective coalitions see themselves as part of something bigger. They understand human contradictions. They know that we need to include all voices, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized, because lasting change needs to be system-wide. Collaborative leaders have a clear-eyed view of where we are today, a shared vision of where we should be heading, and the courage to make mistakes along the way. They focus on networks rather than standalone heroes. It's more Indra's web than a pyramid with someone at the top. Think of Fridays for the future and what tens and then hundreds and then millions of young people achieved in waking the world up to climate change. Or TED Countdown, one of the global initiatives I'm working with to accelerate climate change solutions. At Countdown, we're working with over 40 organizations, as well as hundreds of local TEDx organizers across 80 countries and reaching tens of millions of people. In my day-to-day -day work, I spend a lot of time helping people build trust. And I know that most of us tend to resist changing our minds and behaviors. Human frailties get in the way. It's much easier to have an opinion about what other people need to do differently than to focus on ourselves. Effort gets derailed by ego. A desire to be right because we really care. A fear of not being in control when in reality, no one's really in control. Focusing on the inner stuff, healing our own wounds, cultivating compassion is a fundamental starting point if we want to be effective bridge builders. So what is this inner stuff? You can think of it as three mindsets. The first is what I call relentless generosity, making room for different ways of thinking and seeing the world. We need people who are wired in different ways. Activists, engineers, artists, inventors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, green collar workers and educators. We need people who can transform our global economy, by scaling solutions like solar, wind, regenerative farming, and protecting and restoring wild places. People who can invent new solutions for tomorrow, like affordable green cement and steel and clean energy storage. We need people from very different backgrounds. People who collaborate successfully typically work very hard behind the scenes. They assume the best of others. There's a spirit of service. Sujata Kandahar, co-founder of Indian NGO Koro, is a great example. She and her team have spent 30 years building a network of thousands of grassroots leaders from the poorest parts of the country. Women who've suffered domestic violence, indigenous people who've been driven from their land, farmers coping with drought and soil degradation. They've created a leadership program that gives people the confidence and skills to launch grassroots movements and help others discover their rights as individuals. Over the years, this incredible network has delivered impact on wide-ranging priorities identified by local communities. Coro leaders have forced the government to construct hundreds of toilet blocks in Mumbai to solve the chronic sanitation problem won forest rights for, across thousands of acres for indigenous communities, created programs to address domestic violence, and installed irrigation systems in drought-hit villages. With gritty determination and a belief in the gifts and talents of every person, 
Sujata and her team embody relentless generosity. The second mindset is endless abundance, seeing plenty where others see scarcity. It's really hard when the things you care most deeply about are at risk and time is running out. But to make good things happen, we need to start from a place of hope, not exhaustion. Just look at what we have in abundance, the awesome diversity of all living things, the fact that we still only understand a fraction of how life works, revolutions in technology and science that are expanding our pool of knowledge, and so much untapped talent. Imagine how much more we'll achieve when we include everyone. Women and girls, people of color, young people, indigenous people. An abundance mindset isn't naive, it's intensely practical. It reminds us that we have everything we need to solve our problems. The third mindset is stubborn optimism, a phrase I learned from Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnak, who you'll meet shortly. It's an attitude they brought to the Paris Climate Agreement, an attitude that says we simply cannot fail that agreement is possible and failure unthinkable. That to get everyone, that to get everyone to, uh, that everyone deserves the dignity of being heard. Now, six years later, we're in the decisive decade. A decade that began with a pandemic and unimaginable disruption. Yet the ways in which populations have responded, the billions of acts of kindness have been so inspiring. Healthcare and essential workers showing extraordinary resilience and courage. Scientists developing more than a dozen vaccines in record-breaking time to save literally millions of lives. So here we are, 2021, still fighting the pandemic, halfway through a crucial year for climate and biodiversity with major UN conferences on both. It's hard not to be overcome by fear of failure and to fear, feel overwhelmed. And yet look at the news on climate alone in the past week. The announcement by the IEA, the most influential energy policy agency in the world, that investment in new fossil fuel supply should end this year to support the path to net zero. Something that would have been dismissed as extremist just a short time ago. On Wednesday, a Dutch court ruled that Shell must drastically accelerate its efforts to reduce its CO2 emissions. The same day, a tiny activist hedge fund won two seats on Exxon's board by challenging its woeful climate strategy. Step by step. None of these outcomes fell out of the sky. They happened because all sorts of unsung heroes worked incredibly hard over years and against the odds to make it so. As Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson put it in their book, All We Can Say, without knowing the outcome, we had to try anyway. Without a single guarantee, we must show up. The way forward, I think, lies in connection, in relationships. The truly radical work is in the middle, not at the extremes. We can choose to be generous, to focus on abundance, to practice stubborn optimism. This is the patient, ambitious work of coalition building, seeing ourselves in a bigger, beautiful picture because we are all pearls in Indra's web. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. So kind of moving and deep. And one question I'd have is like, um, how are you seeing this uh, kind of like emerging in the on on that global level? Because you talked about lo uh, quite a lot of things on the lo local level. What's a, a kind of a quick uh, understanding of something where that kind of more local or regional is connected directly into something in the global? Yeah, I mean, I think that the part of what we all need to get as human beings is the intense relationship between who we are as people and how we show up. And that's the case whether you're a president or a prime minister or the head of some big agency or, or doing something apparently much more humble and at the grassroots. And so, so that connection is imperative. And I think a lot of the greatest inspiration we can get does come from the grassroots. Having said that, if you take climate change in one of the areas I'm working on, right now we are seeing change happen at scale. And yes, it's not enough and we need much more, but we're so much far advanced than we could have imagined even six months ago. 
And you're seeing this interplay, if you like, between communities, between voters, between ordinary citizens and between political actors. And in that spiral, so people find their courage to do, to do the bold thing. So I, I think the interplay between individual ordinary citizens and, you know, frankly, the political systems of the systems in democracies, at least, that we choose, um, and, and one reflects the other. And in that sense, we all have power and we all have influence. Fabulous. That's a great finishing off. And I'm sure we could spend the rest of the time talking about this. And unfortunately, we have limited time. But fortunately, we have your good friend, uh, Tom Rivet Karnak, coming next. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. And uh, now uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Tom into the um, to this. So uh, Tom Rivet Karnak, um, he has uh, been a very influential person. Um, because um, he worked a lot to help the uh, COP21, uh, the Paris Agreement, um, be delivered. Um, he's had many different uh, sort of hats that he's worn over the years, um, but now he's best known for working on uh, Global Optimism as its founding partner. He's also the founding partner of TED Countdown. As I mentioned, he's uh, very familiar with Lindsay because he's an associate of Lindsay's organization, Leaders Quest, and he's released his book, Future, the future we choose. So if I can hand over to Tom to do an introduction and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you so much, New. Absolutely wonderful to be here and, and just a delight to be following Lindsay as well with that amazing overview of some of the challenges we face. Um, so just, I mean, a, a small background to me, I've been working in climate change for 20 years. I started off in the private sector. I then worked for NGOs. In 2012, I went to work for Christiana Figueres as the head of political strategy and was alongside her and so many other hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people to deliver the Paris Agreement in 2015. And really since then, I've tried to um, navigate my way through this world to identify how I can work with partners, find the right collaborations, find the right coalitions in order to have a transformative impact on where we are. It's six years since Paris, and in many ways, as Lindsay said, we have come further and faster than we ever thought possible. However, the reality that we have to face is it's nowhere near fast enough. Um, we have now entered this most decisive decade in the history of humanity. And it sounds like an exaggeration to say that, but it's really not. By 2030, we will either have come together to reduce emissions by 50% and be on a pathway to dealing with this, or we will have lost control of the climate and all of the impacts that that will have for future generations. So I think at that moment, what the interesting question to me is exactly the one that Lindsay nailed. No one is coming along to do this for us. No one's gonna come along and make this transformation. Either those of us who are here now, friends, family, colleagues, people that you know, we're gonna find a way to deal with this or we're not gonna be able to. And the key there lies in who we are, how we show up and how we work together. Looking back at the Paris Agreement, one of the things, and Christiana and I have reflected on this and we've written about it in our book, what we've realized is that this sense of kind of determination and coming together and collaboration and optimism were not the result of the success in Paris, they were the cause of it. And it was, it was ever this way, right? I mean, if you look back at history, there have actually been many moments where we've been facing really difficult, impossible mountains to climb. And it has been, for whatever reason, it's been possible for a sense of courage, of determination, of optimism, of generosity to emerge out of that darkness and coalescing around that built a movement that changed the world. I mean, think about one of my favorite examples, of course, is the suffragettes. Courage calls to courage everywhere. They demonstrated that that sense of courage and coming together could actually precipitate a change that changed the world. But we see this again and again. You know, fight them on the beaches, I have a dream, the salt marches, uh, Gandhi salt marches to the beach. These were moments of real challenge where individuals worked out how to collaborate, how to be generous, how to actually work towards a common purpose, and that's what changed the world. So right now, you know, this is a challenge. This is, many people are overwhelmed by this, but it's also an enormous privilege to be here right now. To change the course of the world in the next 10 years is to have as much or more of an impact on the future as any generation that has yet lived. And yes, probably we all get a little frisson of fear when we realize the scale of the challenge that we're facing. 
But the truth is that this is also an enormous privilege and an enormous adventure. And we should ride out to meet it with determination and courage because we can turn this around and we should, we should relish that possibility and that chance. So great to be here and looking forward to a discussion with you. Thank you. And wonderful introduction. Um, one of the things that I'd like to uh, ask you as a question is um, regarding that, how do we kind of uh, scale our personal impact? Because obviously there's lots of things that we can do as an individual. You know, like uh, recycle better, uh, we can change our savings, we can choose where we do our transport. But that, and, and that's great and the, uh, really important. And then what I think you're offering here is how as individuals and as, as then collectives, we can make massively bigger impacts compared to our, in, uh, as, as an individual. So, and how we do that is through influencing. So can you talk through uh, like uh, one or two examples where you've kind of like worked to influence situations or seen other people help influence situations so that their, their individual impact has been scaled kind of exponentially? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think it's one of the things that people struggle with most in climate change, right? It feels so large. It feels so remote. It feels so far away. And our own sphere of impact feels so small that the differential between the two feels often ungulfable. And that's what can lead to a sense of grief, a sense of dejection, a sense that we're not going to be able to do this. Now, the first thing I'd say in that is, and it's really important to become aware of this, that was deliberately constructed as an attempt to slow progress. We think of it as an inevitable outcome of the scale of the differential between our own ability to have an impact and the scale of what needs to happen. But actually, there are lots of examples of places where we can take small actions towards big shared goals and still feel that work meaningful. I mean, an unfortunate example, but an interesting one, would be engaging as a soldier in a war, right? I mean, no individual soldier could feel that they could solve the war themselves or they could actually break through and, and, and find the solution that would end the conflict. But everybody did their part towards it. I mean, one other that I've talked about before is um, if you were to have an ill relative or an ill child, right? Um, the example in climate change is it's only meaningful if you have control over the outcome. And we've all heard this from family members, from other people, you know, why do you stop flying? Why do you not, re you know, why, why do you recycle? Why do you stop eating meat? All these other things. It's not going to have an overall impact on the outcome. And so therefore the implication goes that has no meaning whatsoever. However, Look at another example of human endeavor, right? I mean, imagine if you had a sick relative or a child and you were caring for them. Would that action only be meaningful if you could control what ultimately happened to that individual and ensure that they got better? That's not the case, right? In fact, the opposite is, case, if, is the case. If that person got more ill or even in a tragic situation, if they passed away, the fact that you would be caring for them would still be full of meaning and would not be connected to the outcome. So we also have to realize that actually breaking that link, we need to do the next right thing and find satisfaction in the areas in which we can have an influence. And actually those can then snowball and become significant. And there's lots of examples of this. I mean, you know, Lindsay mentioned one a minute ago. The court case that went through this week in the Netherlands to mandate, and you'll know about this as a lawyer, to mandate Royal Dutch Shell to reduce emissions by 45% by the end of the decade from last year as a baseline is a remarkable outcome that looked incredibly unlikely when it was initially brought. This is a few individuals who decided that they were going to have a go at doing this. These individuals that come together that try to precipitate a big change, whether it's at the community level that then inspires greater change or taking on power, those are some of the ways in which we can really make a difference. That's great. And that's a, a really good example of how people have taken like a small thing and looked at kind of scale it exponentially. And I think actually one of the things that will, uh, basically everybody that is a speaker and is being featured on Change Now, they've made that choice to whether it's a, to create their own sustainable startup or to create their own uh, legal initiative in, in the Netherlands, they're doing that. So could you tell us a little bit more about some of the things that you've been doing personally to kind of scale the influence um, that you, you can do? You mean in my own personal life or in the work that I do with Global Optimism? What work that you've been doing with Global Optimism and then maybe any things before Global Optimism. 
Yeah, sure. So, so when, when Christiana and I left the UN together in 2016 and decided that we wanted to set up this small organization to try to be catalytic and try to support and elevate those individuals and organizations that can really bend the needle and do work that is at that intersection of the practical impl implementation of the solutions and some of these deeper transformative steps that need to be taken by all of us that Lindsay was talking about earlier. I mean, our partnership with TED Countdown and with Leaders Quest is fundamental to what we're doing. And that's absolutely, I mean, people should look out for Take Countdown later this year. The first round on 1010 last year was amazing. And then this year in October as well, will be an amazing segue into Glasgow that will bring together sectors for transformative breakthroughs, individual platforms like the CounterSim platform to look at how all individuals can get involved. That's been a really central and interesting part of our work. There's also a range of other things we do, and we try to look at how we can both weave new narratives and also support sectoral decarbonizations. So in the new narratives and elevating other stories, you mentioned the future we choose. We wrote that book where we look at the basics of how the Paris Agreement came to happen, the kinds of mindsets that are now necessary to get us to the next phase, and what all individuals can do in order to help us precipitate this breakthrough now. Christiana and I also run a podcast with our friend Paul Dickinson. Each week we interview people. We just had John Kerry on and Prince William to try to sort of look at the narrative that can be transformed. It's called Outrage and Optimism. It comes out on a Thursday each week. So those are two examples in the narrative side. We then also work on sectoral decarbonization. You know, where is the needle and how can we move it with particular sectors? And there, we're so excited about some of the technical transformations that are coming through and the impact that that's going to have on an emissions trajectory in the coming years. I mean, central to that is our work with Amazon, actually. With Amazon, Christiana and Jeff Bezos co-created the Climate Pledge in 2019, which is a commitment from corporations to get to net zero by 2040. So we've been working together with the Amazon team, creating this new initiative to get companies to make that commitment and to take concrete steps towards it. And what's interesting is a pledge like that that's created by a business, by definition, is very entrepreneurial, very forward looking, very interesting to see how they collaborate. I mean, Amazon created a $2 billion fund just to look at the technological innovations that need to be scaled in order to help all of the companies that have joined the pledge actually implement that commitment. So again, that's been a sort of different element to the sort of NGO type work of building collaborations to then also look at what are some of the commercial tools that can scale that and take it further. We also have a relationship with Macquarie, which some people might find surprising. I mean, Macquarie came from fossil fuel background infrastructure creation. We formed that relationship with them because they are a $700 billion infrastructure and real assets company. And they are genuinely serious about transforming that entire portfolio to net zero. So throughout the partnership and the work we've, that we've induced with them, uh, they've made a commitment that their entire portfolio will be net zero by 2040. Now, $700 billion buys a lot of ports and roads and airports and other things. And they're saying to every single one of those assets that they need to create a business plan within two years to be at net zero by 2040, or they'll be offloaded from the portfolio of Macquarie. So this is some of the most sort of fascinating, interesting intersections that we get to sort of look across the space with some of these different uh, projects that we work on. One additional one um, that I'll mention is a really fascinating startup called Heisen that have developed and operate the world's most powerful drivetrain for hydrogen trucks that they're now taking to scale. So we're working with Heisen and helping them scale that in order to transform the world of transportation. So, you know, fun stuff. That's fantastic. And so um, can you, uh, in a sense, what you've actually indicated that sometimes we can't choose the perfect partner to work with to, to make progress happen. Um, so tell me a bit more about how you've been working um, maybe with partners and it, you, you might tell us about so a bit more about Macquarie or um, one of the others um, who aren't necessarily natural bedfellows for a kind of um, a climate organization, but you've chosen to work or you've seen that working well because actually there's that reach out to create that coalition. Yeah, so, I mean, Christiana and I are eternal pragmatists, right? I mean, I have endless respect for people who sort of look at the world and say, it should be this way, I have a vision, let's work towards it. And I think it's essential that we have those people that are really calling out what's necessary. They are planting the flag for the future that we really want and then working towards it. 
for myself, and maybe it's a function of age, you know, what I find as I get older is that what I actually want is to see where is the needle today and how can I move it even a bit? How can I have that satisfaction of seeing that whatever kind of mess the world might be in right now, there are steps we can take piece by piece, little by little to make progress towards it. And in that, partners like Amazon and Macquarie and others are actually perfect because in those, those are the institutions that have the power to make transformative difference, right? They've got capital, they have determination, they have market share. And if those individuals and if those companies can actually find the courage and the determination to make those changes, that's what's gonna make the difference for all of us. So in a way, you know, we, we work with them on all kinds of levels. We work with them on how do you help build constituency internally to create the kind of transformative change that's necessary. That's about determination, it's about courage, it's about commitment. We then also work on what are the right constituencies and partnerships that can actually be created to facilitate that type of action. The types of partnerships that Lindsay's talked about are emerging all over the world at the moment, but they're not necessarily everybody's instinct to partner in that way. You know, business has an instinct to, to, to be competitive and that's great and we should welcome that, but that competitive edge has to be tempered with a sense of collaborating towards shared outcomes as well. So much of what we also work on is, you know, you know, how do you build the courage internally? How do you cultivate the type of spirit that facilitates the sorts of partnerships that enable, enable you to break through? And then how do you implement and how do you work towards those implementations? So, you know, we don't see ourselves as consultancies. We see our, as a consultancy, we see ourselves as strategic partners building things together. And, um, and I think in that position, we can sort of have the authority to, uh, to help them with breakthroughs. Brilliant, brilliant. So one of the things actually that I'm sure the, uh, well, I would hope anyway, that the audience have been inspired by these fantastic big uh, sort of collaborations that you've been generating. But for many of the audience, they'll be kind of like maybe earlier in their journey. So one of the things that um, you, to get to the place where you are now, where you're talking to the Amazons of this world and you're working in the UN, uh, a question I'd have is to think for you to think back to maybe earlier in your career and what was something that you did um, that was kind of like um, helped you on those steps on the way. So it's not like a big glamorous thing like, you know, you're doing now, but like more humble, but nonetheless, a really important step that maybe it was 10, 15, even 20 years ago to help you. So that can provide some comfort to those people out there that are listening that, yes, actually, I could be part of this solution, just like Tom is now on the big scale. Well, I mean, you know, I think we all, we all follow our lives step by step, right? And luck plays a bigger role in most of our lives than most of us ever really admit. Um, and that go, that cuts both ways. But I will answer your question as you've asked it. So I, I actually started my career, um, I've had a peculiar, circuitous career in many ways. And um, I actually started off by spending the first half of my 20s living in monasteries in Burma and Northeast Thailand. And I was living in Buddhist monasteries, something I'd always wanted to do as a child. And living there as a forest monk, I would have a lot of time to myself. And actually during that time, when you sort of slow down, after you know the sensory input of the world comes at you very fast and you kind of get used to that scale of sensory input but then when you slow down initially it's kind of terrible but then after a while your mind slows down a bit and you can observe some of your internal processes and what happens then is you start to understand the relationship between things happening in the world and how you react to them and there's a small tiny bit of light between something happening in the world and you choosing to react in a particular way and that bit of light that seems so connected to the phenomena, someone shouts and I feel angry, something else happens and I have an instinctive response. When you slow down enough to see that little chink of light and realize that all of those reactions are a choice, then actually what you find is in the right context, that becomes a sort of superpower, right? Because you're not being thrown around by your reactions, but you're able to participate and choose how to respond in any particular situation. If you're asking for things in my past that have created my present or my future, that has been the single most important lesson that I've ever learned because it enables you to not be blown around by what happens to you, but to choose your life and construct it in a more deliberate way. And the world needs that, right? I mean, I don't claim to have a monopoly on it and it's, you know, it's, it drifts away from me as many years ago at all. And many people are far more adept at this than me. 
but we're having we have now collectively as lindsay said to make a choice about our future that's different from our past and the instinctive reaction that we have is of course to keep recreating the future even if we do that unconsciously if we can actually find a way to participate in our own decision making from a technical and emotional level that enables us to make the past the future different from the past and that's the thing that i would say is actually it sounds like it sounds bizarre and like a weird answer to your question that is very a very worldly question but actually i think it's not an add on it's 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 the fundamental core of the qualities that we now need to develop to do the next stage of what we're what we're up against brilliant that's fantastic thank you um yeah the spiritual uh, journey will help us with our planetary and environmental journey so fantastic uh, finishing point for our conversation there Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, for obviously, for anybody out there that wants to get a bit more of Tom, there is his book, "The Future We Choose," and also the fabulous uh, uh, podcast, um, "Outrage and Optimism." So, and um, yeah, uh, please do uh, connect with those. And thank you so much, Tom, for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we come on to the final section of. Uh, today's uh, on Global Coalition, um, where I'd like to introduce Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who is uh, from the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and also President of the Earth Institute at the Columbia University, and just for good measure, is also Director at the Center for Sustainable Development. Um, and then also we have Jan Aguila, um, who is uh, a fantastic uh, lawyer who's so passionate about making the world a better place. And uh, the main thing that he's expressing at the moment with that is the Global Pact Coalition, which he's the general di director general for. So what I'd like to do is uh, really start off with um, maybe a, a, a quick introduction, uh, just add a little bit more of a flavor about yourselves um, and then what we'll do is we'll come on to, uh, for, particularly for you, uh, Jan, um, more about the, uh, the global pact. So, uh, so we'll, we'll introduce the global pact a little later. Um, so, because what I'm really interested in is, what do you think is that your journey as to why global cooperation is so important and then, um, and what are you doing uh, wh why that's so important, actually. The first question is, why is global cooperation so important? And start with you, Jeffrey. Well, that, that's easy because we're in trouble. Uh, so uh, if you're in trouble, uh, you better start rowing in the same direction. Uh, we're in trouble uh, ecologically, socially, geopolitically. Uh, we've got a lot to cooperate about. Um, and when it comes to the area that Jan and I are uh, deeply engaged together in uh, protecting the environment. We have climate change, which is uh, bearing down on us. We have the destruction of biodiversity, the loss of rainforests, destruction of ecosystems, mega pollution, overfishing. Uh, the, the world economy just uh, broke loose of uh, its boundaries and has created huge environmental damages. And because they are global, no one country alone not any region alone could solve the climate change crisis or uh, the uh, collapse of biodiversity or the pollution in the oceans. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't even make sense to think about this as a one at a time or bottom up uh, venture alone. Of course, each business, uh, each person uh, has their own responsibilities, but we need a global framework to get a global scale solution. Fabulous, thank you. So, um, Jan, why else would you say that we, we need we need this global um, sort of coalition? Yes, first I, I agree one hundred percent with Jeff that we uh, one state cannot fight alone uh, for uh, biodiversity for uh, uh, climate change. So we need cooperation. But in addition, I can say that. We need cooperation, I think, by law, because we need the law. Uh, we know that the law is not all. We need also money, we need funding, we need tax policies, etc. But the law is the heart of our society. That's why we need law, and we need the law 
at the global scale, at the international level, um, because we must act together, all the states. And that's why we need, at the end, we need international environmental law. And if you make a kind of diagnosis on international environmental law, what, what we can see? We can see that we have many texts many texts. There is a very interesting uh, report from the Secretary General of the United Nations on, on this issue. Many texts, but um, first, uh, we have difficulties to apply this text. We need um, a, a, a framework uh, to give consistency to this uh, uh, text. And they are very sectorial. You have one text for each issue. You have uh, a text for the climate, it's the Paris Agreement, a text for biodiversity, a text for pollution, a text for waste, etc. So you have many texts, but um, it's strange, but we have not one framework, one treaty about the environmental and, and, and environmental as a whole. So we think that we need uh, in addition to this sectorial text, this technical text, we need a framework to show the way to uh, bring together all the states to uh, work together, because we need cooperation by the law. Fabulous. Um, so I think that's actually really good timing to bring in, actually, the uh, that's the uh, kind of what we need. And actually, I know that uh, Jan and uh, uh, Professor Sachs, you've worked together to produce something. So this is the Global Pact. And fortunately, we have a fabulous video to explain this. So if the technical team can uh, play uh, uh, the video, please. Have you ever heard of the Global Pact for the Environment? It's an international treaty the United Nations is talking about. The pact is supported by scientists, professors, students, celebrities, artists, and many climate advocates who all believe that the time to act for our planet has come. The bad news is that some states oppose its adoption. But the good news, there's still a chance. The people's movement can push states to act and adopt the Global Pact for the Environment. A legal text that proposes a set of mandatory rights and duties for all, for all to protect the environment. Because after 50 years of declaration and treaties, efforts to protect the environment and life on Earth are clearly insufficient. Because beyond our difference and our origins, all living beings form the community of life on Earth. Because our societies are structured around the law, we must recognize at the global level the essential principles of environmental protection. A pact that can become the foundation of a new social contract for humanity. A contract that allows us to protect the environment because it's the best way to bring people the possibilities of a better life. A pact that recognizes the right of everybody to a healthy environment, that recognizes the duty of states and citizens everywhere to take care of the environment. A pact that answers to young generation, civil society, all of us, actually. Because we need to lay the foundation for a new and more united world to better protect our planet and mankind. We have proposed a global pact for the environment. Because there is only one planet, we have no other choice. Today, the time has come to adopt a global pact for the environment. Let's demand that the states recognize our right to a healthy environment. Join the Global Pact Coalition. Sign up and share this video.
So inspirational video there. So what I'd like to do is first of all go to um, Jan to understand um, where, where they're at with the growth of the pact. And then we'll go to Jeffrey to discuss, uh, first of all, his engagement with the pact. And then certainly I know Jeffrey's involved in some very other interesting global coalition work. So first of all, you, Jan, um, where, where is the pact in its development? Yes. Um... As you understood, uh, I have the honor to be one of the initiators of the Global Pact for the Environment, together with Jeffrey Sachs, with Laurent Fabius, the father of the Paris Agreement. And uh, we think that the time has come now to recognize new rights for citizens, the rights in the field of environment. And this is the goal of, uh, of this text, of the, the pact. It could be a kind of funding, funding text uh, in this field. Why? First, there are some legal reasons. Um, it's about rights. It's about our rights. And, uh, you know, these rights are very tangible, very practical for citizens. To take a concrete example, if a company pollutes your land, you want to sue this company in court and you need a legal basis. For example, you could argue that the polluter violates your rights, your rights, the right to a healthy environment. But the issue is that first, this right is often not recognized in domestic law, and sometimes uh, some new political majorities go back and uh, withdraw, for example, to the Paris Agreement or some other rights. So the pact, we need the pact to protect these rights at an international level. It is a legal reason. And, and I think there, there is also a political, a symbolic reason. Because, you know, at certain points in the history of society, we need a moment that could be called a constitutional moment, a moment when we set out the values that bring us together. That's why in many countries we have constitutions, we have great declarations, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence in the US, the Declaration of Human Rights in France, and at the international level, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it is only about civil rights, political rights, not about environmental rights. And this kind of text play a catalytic role to show the way. It's a kind of social contract. I believe in the power of values and ethics. And this is uh, what the Global Pact uh, is, uh, is about. You know, it is this kind of text that you can put on the world of a classroom uh, to, so that everyone can know their rights and duties, also duties toward the planet. Great stuff. Okay, thank you. So moving to you, Jeffrey, um, I'd like to find out just quickly what's your sort of involvement with the pact, but then also I know that you're being involved um, with some very other interesting things, such as the kind of global cooperation on the COVID recovery. Um, which is like what's happening now. So the pact is like how do we make things for the future? But what, So like maybe a little bit about what you're doing uh, on the pact and then what you're doing for uh, COVID recovery. Well, as uh, Jan has just explained, uh, we have a, a missing piece of global law and global law also expresses global values. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is uh, sometimes called the moral charter of the United Nations. It says that there are economic, civil, and political rights that constitute human rights. Essentially, the Global Pact says, yes, also environmental rights, because we need to survive, we need to live on this planet uh, in a sustainable way. In 1948, the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, led by Eleanor Roosevelt, weren't aware of the environmental catastrophes that would come in the following seven decades. So environment was not included in the Universal Declaration. 
And I think the global pact is essentially saying, let's catch up in the 21st century to make clear that we have, again, at the base uh, body of international law, international moral principles, international human rights, the right to a safe environment. I think it's going to come. Uh, and I think that maybe 2023 will be a breakthrough occasion because that will be the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a, a wonderful document, really important for the world, very live, very active, uh, being used all over the world to defend civil rights, political rights, and, and the economic rights, but they, it could also be used to defend e environmental rights. It's interesting, and I think uh, very notable for us, that just a couple of days ago, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands ruled against Shell Oil, saying, you can't go on doing what you're doing, because it is a threat to world survival. Very practical, highest court in the country. If we had a global pact, that would be happening all over the world, not one by one. It would be recognized as a global uh, uh, mandate and a global constitutional uh, fundamental right. I think this is going to get done. Uh, Jan's leadership is uh, inspiring. Uh, Laurent Fabius, you just can't wish for anyone else on your side. <laughs> He's the greatest. And, and uh, I, I think uh, it's taking time. And of course, there was pushback during the Trump administration. You couldn't get global agreement on anything. Uh, now we have a chance, actually, for some global agreement. So I think it's time to double down the work on this. But as you say, basically, we so many of our challenges don't understand international borders, which, after all, are a, an artificial human construction. Certainly SARS cov 2 virus doesn't get it. I mean, they don't stop at the passport. They don't stop at the border. Sorry, I don't have a visa. I can't come in here. So the, the virus is uh, going everywhere. The carbon dioxide is mixing uniformly uh, in the planet. The fish don't stay in their national boundaries uh, with their fish passports. Uh, and so when there's overfishing, <laughs> we uh, lose uh, fisheries. Biodiversity needs to be protected globally because that's a global heritage. It may exist within one or two countries of particular species of value for all of humanity, but that is a global effort and a global responsibility. Sometimes poor countries are the habitat of a species facing extinction. Now that country has responsibilities, but it should also have the uh, help from the rest of the world. There should be a duty of the rest of the world to help a poor country protect its fragile and endangered biodiversity as well. So there's hardly an area in the world that comports with the way the world was viewed in 1648 when the Europeans decided that it was going to be nation states under the Treaty of Westphalia. So that was uh, 400 years ago. Uh, maybe at the time, having a boundary uh, and uh, a, a span of 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers made sense given uh, the level of technologies uh, and trade, but we're living in a global world right now. So we need international law. We need international principles. We need common values. We need common standards. We need to fight pandemics, not one country at a time, but globally. I, I, I think our national governments don't get it very much. It's, when you have a psychopath like we had as president, uh, they get it even less. Uh, but uh, even when you have decent politicians, you know, they look to their local voters, so they're not so attuned to global challenges necessarily. But then come great leaders uh, like uh, Fabius, who presided over an agreement reached in Paris in December 2015, that now is our, our hope for avoiding climate disaster. So it took someone with a global vision to bring everybody together. But that's what we really need to do on many, many crucial issues right now. Absolutely. I, I love the idea of the, the people have been talking about COVID passports and you've given a, another spin to the concept of COVID having a passport. 
No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so, so Jan, um, can you uh, tell us what your next steps on the, um, uh, the, the, the Global Pact are planned? And, and that, this will be kind of the wrap up to, uh, of our conversation. Yes. Uh, okay. It basically, uh, it's like um, uh, you know a Netflix series. There is there have been three seasons. Uh, the season one was the season of the success story of the pact because we proposed this the global pact, and in uh, 2000, 2018, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution entitled toward the global pact for the environment and this resolution opened the negotiation uh, between states uh, on the pact it was the first step the second season uh, in uh, 2019 was the season of the difficulties of the pact and like uh, uh, jeffrey said um, it was with difficult with the trump administration you can imagine and we met great difficulties. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, states adopted a new resolution in 2019, uh, which decided to uh, prepare only a political declaration. So it was a disappointment because we preferred a treaty, an international treaty, legally binding. But at the end of the day, and it's no, we are no living season three. Negotiations on the declaration are underway and everything is possible. The goal is 2022. Why 2022 next year? Because in 2022, we will have the next Earth Summit 50 years after the famous uh, Stockholm Declaration. And it could be an opportunity to uh, make pressure on states and uh, to uh, adopt a very ambitious declaration. It could be a, a fantastic text. It could be a text, for example, recognizing the right to a healthy environment. So we decided together to uh, create a coalition, a global pact coalition to bring together all, not only jurists, not only academics, but also all citizens, all companies, all NGOs who want this uh, text uh, adopted. And uh, you can, uh, if you want to go further, as you so in the, in the video, uh, you can go on our website, the globalpactenvironment.org site, and you will have all uh, the information to help us to convince the state that time has come to adopt this, this uh, text in 2022. Wonderful. That's, that's a fantastic uh, finish there, because unfortunately we have run out of time. I'm sure that from both of you, we could uh, continue the conversation, um, but we have to finish now. And so I just want to say thank you so much uh, to both Jeffrey and uh, Jan, um, who are providing such uh, passion and leadership and intelligence and emotional intelligence as well about how you go about that. And I think that the, what I've just said can very much equally apply to uh, Lindsay and Tom, um, who have been, I just think, uh, all four of you have just been inspiring us on how we can build coalitions on both local, national and global level. And as Tom said, it's also about our own spiritual journey as well. So thank you to everybody and thank you for the audience for being here and paying your attention.